prepared a completely different talk, but after listening to the news of the riots of last Black Friday, I decided to change my talk, and we're going to be talking about enoughness. So do you ever ask yourselves, how much is enough? Enough to make you happy? Enough to carry you into the future? Well, I've asked myself this question as well, and so I set out to find some clues in the wisdom of indigenous people. The images you're going to see behind me are snippets from stories that I've worked on for the past 20 years. My camera has taken me to about 100 countries in every continent in the world, and I've used it to shine a light on issues related to conservation, but particularly on the point where healthy ecosystems intersect with the faith of indigenous people. I've been extremely lucky to spend a lot of time in the solitude of nature and in the company of people who live isolated but are self-sufficient, and they carve a living with their own bare hands that is full of meaning and full of poetry. And it is from them that I started thinking about enoughness. Um, to start off, I wanted to tell you a story. I just came back from Hawaii. <laughs> I arrived yesterday, hence the tan. <laughs> and um, I've been working there for, for National Geographic magazine, doing a story on the traditional Hawaiian culture. While I was there, I had the opportunity of photographing a man named Keoni Nunez, and he's a master of the ancient art of cacao, which is traditional tattooing. While he was working on this young man's tattoo, he told me that he grew up on a shack on the beach without much wealth, but surrounded by his ohana, his family, and seeped deep in tradition and speaking his native Hawaiian language and surfing on one of the most beautiful beaches on the world with all of his friends. He said to me, I never knew I was poor until somebody from the mainland told me. I always thought I had enough. And that, to me, was such a huge revelation. His story resonated with me because this is something that I've seen in many traditional societies. See, we judge them as poor by our own standards, but many of them are actually quite content. Why? You know, I, I've learned a lot from indigenous people, and um, one of the things that I've learned is that our happiness is only due about 10% to material stuff. So where does the other 90% that makes us feel good come from? And it's not from material things, you know. Contentment is something that is long-lasting, that comes from inside, and that it, it's basically the satisfaction of knowing what our place in the universe is. So if I had to define enoughness, I would tell you that it's an internal yardstick. It's something that only we can develop. And if, if indigenous people have been doing it for so long, maybe this is something we can learn for ourselves. And maybe this is a tool that would carry us into that sustainable future that we all dream about. So, let me tell you first that enoughness is amazing because it really cuts across all indigenous cultures. It doesn't matter where you go. And it basically distills to, if you have clean water, a net full of fish, and a warm fire, that's basically all people need to feel quite content. I photographed this girl, she's from a Viso tribe in western Madagascar, and she was coming home after trying to catch supper for her family. She, she didn't have much luck. But she was incredibly proud because she had been given this amazing responsibility. And I remember thinking, you know, at the time she was not much older than my own daughter. And I certainly would have not trusted my daughter with boiling a hot dog, let alone bringing dinner for the whole family. <laughs> but it also got me thinking that when you give responsibility to every member of a family or every member of a community to share in pulling together, you know, collaborating to make sure that everybody's okay, that is a great way to build enoughness. I love this photograph because it reminds me that you can be very serious about culture, but without sacrificing fun. These gentlemen are from a tribe of Eastern Highlanders in Papua New Guinea, and they compete every year. They get together and they have this huge festival. So thousands of people dressed up come and they compete to see who is the most traditional. You know, so they're not only super proud of who they are, their traditions and their culture, they, they want to share it. This is my friend Pointuk. She's the eldest daughter of Chief Pukachiri, who lives in a village in the Amazon. And I've been lucky to trek with Pointuk many times into the forest. She's amazing, you know, she can find these invisible trails that I don't see, and she can find where the acai tree, have you guys tried acai? Where it grows, and then she can climb up the tree about 40 feet, you know, even when she's pregnant. And with her machete, she'll cut it down and bring it down. Pointuk has actually tried to teach me how to navigate the river and how to build a fire. And although some days I like to fantasize that I am as capable as Pointuk, 
The truth is, you know, I'm just an ignorant outsider with a lot of expensive gear around my <laughs> neck. So the thing that Point Duke has really taught me is that I need to not take myself so seriously. Humor is another great way of building enoughness. Late one afternoon, I was able to photograph these beautiful girls as they were taking a bath in a river in the Amazon, in this beautiful waterfall. And I remember thinking, God, these girls are lucky. You know, they don't have a worry in the world. The river and the forest provide everything they need. And um, they don't have to worry about whether Miley Cyrus is twerking or they don't have, <laughs> it's just a peer pressure or Justin Bieber. You know, um, one of the things that I remember thinking is that these girls, you know, they own no, almost nothing beyond the little clothes that they're wearing. But if you look at their bodies, they're painted. And that painting is part of a very rich tradition that ties them deeply to every member of their family. It's part of the social bonding, how they paint each other. And uh, that sense of connection is what makes a, you know, a huge part of enoughness. All across the world, indigenous people and indeed families everywhere, having that sense of connection to each other, to the environment, to ritual, that's what gives meaning and purpose to our lives. And that's what builds enoughness. So whether I'm trekking in the forest of the Yunnan province of China with people that still remember where their sacred foods grow, or I'm visiting the underworld with Mayan people that visit the watery graves where their ancestors were buried thousands of years ago, I, I always try to think about how much is enough. And one of the best places to find enoughness is in the arts. Indigenous people have perfected their artistic skills, and some of them take it over the top. <laughs> Um, and for many of them, art, you know, the fine arts, arts and crafts, uh, body ornamentation is part of a rich spiritual life. This man is a, is an Asaro Madman from the highlands of Papua New Guinea. And he believes that if he dresses himself up like the mud of the Asaro River, his enemies will not be able to see him. Um, and what about play? You know, we pity children that, uh, like indigenous children, will never get a chance to go to school, and we feel sorry for them. But the truth is that they get to you know, be creative in their play, and they play outdoors all the time. And what they're learning is real life skills. They, they learn how to weave, and how to cook, and how to hunt. And can you imagine the creative potential of people who are never hooked to an iPhone or a computer? <laughs> so the other thing that's interesting about indigenous people is that we are always worried about investing and saving for the future. For them, they live in the day to day. They live so present and in the moment. And that, too, is part of their enoughness. So I've been incredibly lucky to spend a lot of time with people that still remember the old ways, and in which every productive activity, be either hunting or harvesting or fishing, still resonates with meaning, meaning and with respect for the land. So whether it is the pantaneiros of Brazil or the fishermen of Abrolhos in Bahia, everything that they do shines with the brightness of enoughness. Now, sadly, a lot of indigenous people are experiencing something that James Cameron would call an avatar syndrome. And they're having to fight the mighty powers of the industrial world with their own bare hands, like these chiefs of the Kayapo. The third largest hydroelectric dam in the world is about to be built on the beautiful forest and river that they call home. Or the Gitgat people of British Columbia, who are fighting to keep mega tankers out of their waters, tankers bigger than the Exxon Valdez. For them, it's not if, but when an oil spill happens, it will destroy their entire livelihood. So I want my images to remind us that when all the rivers have been dammed and all the forests have been turned into chopsticks and the last wild creature has been hunted for a trophy, we will all be a lot poorer. But it's people like this hunt android woman from Madagascar who live on the razor's edge between poverty and nature that will be left feeling less than enough. And the reason it matters is because people who are living a sustainable life today, like this mosquito fisherman from Honduras who dives for lobsters to feed his family, or this young girl from the foothills of the Andes who watches her family's sheep after school, they will be left with less than enough to eat. So I encourage us all to go back to that initial question and ask, how much is enough? I know the answer for myself, and I ask myself every day, with every consumer choice, with everything I buy. But if we turn the mirror of enoughness towards you, maybe you will start asking yourself. And maybe that will lead us to that sustainable future that we all dream about. Thank you so much.